awesome God that we serve. Please remain standing. We are going to open in a word of prayer at this time. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just pray that anyone that's out here today that doesn't know Christ as Savior, today they would come to know Jesus. Lord, we just pray that those that are struggling with things in their life and don't know what to do and don't know how to handle it, that they would give it to Jesus here at the altar, Lord. And we pray you be with Pastor as he brings forth your message, Father, that our hearts would be open and you would just allow the Holy Spirit to flow through him and empower him, Father. And allow us to obey what your word says, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. We're going to look at number 43 in our hymnals. Great is thy faithfulness. 43, you're going to have to lift it up with us. Watch me on that last. And we will slow it down there. But number 43, lift it up. serve that great God and right now we'll give it over to pastor and we'll have Brittany um, playing on the flute and in just a little bit he's still working on me all right good morning good to see you in the Lord's house today trust the Lord will bless you just a couple quick reminders next Sunday is our 37th church anniversary and so we're looking forward to a great day Sunday school is normal church is normal and then we'll have a pitch in dinner following that, that pitch in to me means that you bring enough food for you and your family and a little bit more for me. And that way, when we have guests, I can invite them to stay and I, stay and I have food for them. I promise I won't eat all of it, so, uh, uh, but I will share it with our guests. So uh, that, that helps real uh, nicely to take care of them. 
So uh, that, that happens. And then after that, about 1, 130 different activities will be taking place in the afternoon. We'll come back in for evening service. We'll be at 3.30 uh, uh, next week and uh, after the activities. So just plan on coming in the morning, staying with us for the day. Look forward to a good time. And, and I know the deacons have announced some of the activities. Uh, Brent, David, does anybody need to say anything there? Why don't you come up here and say that? All right, we have a sign-up sheet. It's sheets in the back. We need workers. We also need two more cake judges, okay? We only have three so far. We can do a three, but we'd like to have five. So if I can eat. All right, you're signed up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be the final judge. <laughs> so anyhow, um, for pony rides, all the kind of different things, like Pastor said, please make sure you bring enough food for everybody. We'll have a great time. Amen. All right, and also uh, on the uh, table across the foyer there is uh, uh, some information about Kids for Christ. That starts Wednesday night, and so uh, you have children in that age group. You certainly want to look uh, at that, and uh, the sign-up sheet there also for it, isn't it? So registration for that, and so uh, uh, that begins this coming Wednesday night. Also want to welcome uh, Linda, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, uh, Vans Camp, is that closed? Okay, all right, she's right down here. We appreciate you being with us in this service today. You'd be sure to meet her. I wonder if it's someone else, maybe first time I didn't get a visitor's card, but we don't want to overlook anyone. Uh, we'd like to recognize you. All right, evidently not. So this time we'll go ahead and receive our tithes, offerings, and gifts to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this great day that you've given to us. Lord, we thank you for the day of remembrance today on 9-11 and what our country endured 15 years ago. But, Lord, thank you for blessing us. And I just pray that you be with every aspect of the service today. But, God, as we come and, and take up this offering, we just pray that you'll bless it. We're so thankful for the way that you provide for us and that you allow us to give back to you. And we pray that you'll use this offering in Christ's precious name. Amen. on us and and even as brother um dave mentioned as he was praying 15 years ago um we had a tragedy here in our nation and this morning you know still the answer is jesus that's what we're going to sing about this morning let's go ahead and stand take your hymnals number 577 lift it up with us bless the nation whose god is the lord bless the land where he reigns and worship his glorious name lift it up with us this morning like i said the answer is still jesus and that is our job to be telling this world. Lift it up with us, 577 this morning. Bless in the nation who's
we'll have the choir come and sing. Take your hymnals. We haven't done this one in a while, but singing about the deep, deep love of Jesus this morning. And he loves us. He is our great God. So lift it up with us this morning. 211. We'll do all three verses as the choir orchestra go down. Oh. 
for trying that one out. Like I said, we haven't done that one in a while, but the message is great there in that song. And right now, I think we will have Miss Amanda. She'll be singing for us, and then Brother Phil will do a quick presentation right after that.
Throughout this, uh, this uh, year, we've been emphasizing different ministries of our church, and September's emphasis is on uh, Cornerstone Baptist Academy. For those of you who may not know, I am the, uh, my name is Phil Woods. I am the principal at Cornerstone Baptist Academy. And I'm going to give you just a little bit of history and, and the philosophy of CBA this morning. Um, August 21st, 1999, Cornerstone Baptist Academy began under the direction of Pastor Mrs. Mitchell. Uh, we started in the Sunday school rooms with our preschool and our kindergarten classes. First grade was start added in August of 2000. Junior high program was uh, added in 2004. And our first graduating class and commencement took place in 2011. Mrs. Mitchell is key and, and uh, the, the motivator and the driver of much of this throughout our history. Mr. Steve Lockett took over as the administrator and 2013, and then I came in 2014. Some may ask, why should Cornerstone Baptist Academy exist? I've been asked that question many years, many times over the, the past 30 years as I've been in Christian education, and I like to respond that Christian schools offer an education that public schools by law can't offer. Our, curricula, our curriculum is based upon the Word of God. We start our classes with prayer. In fact, we often mention it seems strange when you start a meeting and people just start, you know, because we're so used to praying and, and, and recognizing God in relationship to what we do. The Word of God is our foundation. God is truth. We spent this summer talking about our biblical worldview, and a biblical worldview is critical and crucial to what we do at Cornerstone Baptist Academy. It's the foundation of all truth and knowledge. It includes the instruction and the training and the faith and the discipline and direction for our Christian living. Christian education, I believe, is mandated in Scripture, given to the responsibility of the Father. We look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it talks about how we're supposed to train our children. 150 years ago, that was done basically in the home. It's not convenient nor um, possible for many parents today. And so the Christian school, along with the church, has come alongside and helped with that, assisted with that. But education is still the responsibility of the home and the responsibility of the father. Christian education begins and is governed by the principles of righteousness and right living. Christ-centeredness is taught in the scripture. Pur purpose of Christian education is to prepare each child to reflect the image of Christ in his personal life, his family life, his church, and his vocation, and that's our mission statement for our school. Father's exhorted in Scripture to accompany his children to the house of the Lord. True Christian education requires two things. It requires a Christian student and a Christian teacher. Without both of those things, we really don't have true Christian education. The student must be willing to be taught and place himself under the authority of the teacher as well as the Word of God for the purpose of growing in wisdom and favor and in knowledge. The teacher must lead by example, model Christ in his actions and his words. I emphasize to our teachers that we're not here. This is not a, just a vocation, but it's a ministry. We are here to minister, and we appreciate that opportunity to minister as, an, as a part of Cornerstone Baptist Academy and a ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Church. We have the passion. Teachers have a passion for the pupil's spiritual and academic development for the proclamation of God, the gospel, and for their own personal development. Academic excellence is more than providing the best education possible with limited resources. Academic ex excellence must involve the parent, the teacher, the principal, the students, all with the philosophy of God's word being our foundation and instructions in word and in wisdom coming from God. For any philosophy to be truly effective, it must be based upon the Word of God, executed faithfully, 
adhered to fervently and embraced by those that are involved. It is the prayer and desire of Cornerstone Baptist Academy that our philosophy permeate every action and decision made in our school ministry and the lives of our students and our staff. And that's just a synopsis of our philosophy statement from our, uh, from our material. Cornerstone Baptist Academy is, a, is another ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Church. We don't exist without the church, and we appreciate the ministry and the support the church gives. Uh, having been in several ministries, I greatly commend and am and very grateful for the insight and the planning and the blessings that have come. This ministry is, school ministry is well blessed with materials and with facilities and with support, and we thank you for that. And um, you'll be hearing from others throughout this month about the ministry of Cornerstone Baptist Academy. Amen. Thank you for the woods. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter number 1. And as you find that, if you are able, in honor of God's word, please stand as we read, beginning with verse number 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Please join us now as we once again look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing today upon your word as we consider some barriers to forgiveness, some reasons why some are not forgiven and perhaps why some cannot be forgiven. We just ask that you would bless uh, all that we say and do that Christ might be exalted today in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. We have gone through a number of building programs here at Cornerstone Baptist Church and in each one I become more aware that the government has put in more and more rules, more barriers to getting permits to building a building. Over the time we've had to change, we've had to install ramps, larger bathrooms to make them uh, wheelchair accessible and, and those are good rules by the way. There are barriers to build though, permits. Oh, that's fun around here. You have to get one from the state. You have to get one from Indianapolis, Marion County, and Lawrence. So you just kind of run down the line, and uh, every one of them wants you to know that they're in charge. So we had to get permits. The, the, we learned that uh, we had to change the kinds of doors that we put in. We learned that uh, we had to do drainage differently. Most of those are reasonable rules. But then there's some real dumb rules that they put in. And I can I'm gonna g give you a couple. Some of you know about these, others may not. When we first built uh, back in 1981, uh, across the street were about three or four houses with gravel driveways. Nothing else was built up around except the church next door and the school next door. And so we submitted our, our drawings and Guy downtown, he just kept calling me back. You got to change this. You got to change this. He said, called me one day and he says, preacher, uh, when you approach the highway out here, he called it a highway, 56th Street, uh, you, you're showing a concrete approach over the drainage ditch uh, and you got to change that. Now, every drive across the street had gravel. We were having a gravel drive at that time. And he said, uh, you've got to change that. You've got to make it asphalt. 
And I said, okay. I said, I thought concrete was better. He said, it is, but it doesn't match the decor of the neighborhood. Dumb rule as far as I'm concerned. When we built this, this building, this part of the, the building, they made us put in uh, a drainage. There's a creek in that woods about uh, uh, 300 foot down uh, the line after you get past the woods. Well, we don't own the woods. So uh, they come and said, uh, well, you've got to put uh, a drainage tile all the way to that creek. Couldn't find anybody to let us cross their property. We finally found a guy that had about maybe from here to that uh, piano space that butted up against our property and he let us do it. But uh, I said to the guy, well, out here, there's a natural ground swell where the ground sits down and the water drains to the, the creek. Can't we just run the water to there, the drainage to there? He said, no, you have to run it all the way to the creek. And it's a tile about that big around. Uh, so uh, we ran it. You get a different inspector when they come back. The inspector looks at it. And he said, you know, that's all fine. But preacher, why didn't you just run it to that groundswell? <laughs> a number of thousand dollars later, <laughs> we find somebody that agrees with me. But that's life. Okay, enough of the dumb things. But the fact is there are many kinds of barriers in this world. Many things that we have to deal with. Some we can see. Others we cannot. There are physical barriers, social barriers, educational barriers, racial, barri uh, racial barriers. But I want to talk today about some spiritual barriers. First of all, we know that God loves us. He tells us time and time again in the scripture that he does. All the way from John 3.16, all the way through the New Testament in particular, but you can go back to the Old Testament and find that that's true. He has shown us how much he loves us by giving his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place that we might be born again, that we might have a home in heaven, that we might have our sins forgiven. And it is his desire because of that, that every one of us in this auditorium and everyone in the world, to be honest, uh, it's his desire that we all go to heaven when we die. Scripture says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. From time to time, over 50 some years of ministry, I've been called to the hospital when someone is about to take their last breath. And it may be a friend, it may be a relative uh, of a church member, but many times it's somebody I've never met. They've never been saved. And they've asked me to come to the hospital and they're hooked up to everything in the world. They can't talk. Uh, you're not sure if they're even hearing you. You do what you can to comfort them and to help them and to point them to Christ, and then they slip off into eternity. And almost always, someone will say in various terms uh, something like this, would you please pray that my loved one will go to heaven? It's too late. We've already done that, but would you pray that they go to heaven now that they have passed? Well, there's a barrier that keeps them from doing that. As you might try to, I try to bring comfort with the family and try to help them, but uh, I cannot give assurance that someone is in heaven that is not. Some of you have been to funerals both ways, saved and unsaved. I never, ever say that a person's in hell, but I don't say that they're in heaven unless I know that they are. I don't want to give false hope uh, to people and I want to be scriptural. You see, there's a barrier between heaven and earth. There's something that will keep every one of us uh, here today from entering heaven if we don't do something about it, and that barrier, of course, is sin. The only assurance that we will overcome that barrier is found by our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as we repent and receive him as our personal savior. But there is that barrier. 
that will keep some from entering to heaven. And that is sin, and they will not repent. The only way to remove that barrier is to accept forgiveness of God. But there are some barriers that sometimes need to be overcome even to do that. There's, first of all, the barrier of denial. Look down at uh, verse 8, if you would, please. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There are those who don't want to acknowledge the fact that they are sinners. But yet the Bible says there's none good, there's none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the last time I, I checked, the word all includes everybody. That's all of us uh, that, that are there. But some people want to look at this and they say, well, I'm not such a bad person. I, I'm not such a rotten person. I haven't done some of the things that others have done. I haven't killed anybody. I uh, haven't robbed a bank. haven't done this or that. But we all still have sin. We cannot change that. There's those that are deny uh, that. And there, there's uh, folks who deny the seriousness of an illness, won't recognize it. Alcoholics deny their true condition. But perhaps the most common denial is that of sinfulness. We do that by justifying ourselves spiritually because we don't want to face guilt. We don't want to take, to take blame. We don't want to accept, accept responsibility. So we justify ourselves to protect ourselves. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. That drives us to Christ. John 16 and verse eight says, and when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. God uses guilt to teach us when we violate his word. We can hide from it or we can admit it. It's up to us. But you see, barrier-free access to God means overcoming denial. The denial that we have any problems, that we are actually sinners in need, that we have needs, that we deny the fact of sin itself. Today, the way, one of the ways we deny sin is we change the meaning of it so that it doesn't sound so bad. There's a number of terms we could use, a number of words we could use, but the, the Bible speaks of drunkards. Today, it's, it's a disease. It's, uh, we, we speak of uh, those who defile themselves among themselves and today we say it's lifestyle. We just change it so it doesn't sound so bad. Abortion is not murder, it's woman's rights, on and on. But it really doesn't matter what we change it to, it's still the same. Doesn't matter how we wanna call it, God still sees it the same and God still deals with it. So we need to overcome those things. Then the next problem is confession of sin. In verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, to be truthful, this chapter is written really to Christians. But there's some principles here that we are going to pull out as we deal with that. The barrier, second barrier, is our inability to confess our failure before God. Once we admit to ourselves we're sinners, then we need to be willing to admit it to God. But I want to tell you, that's a thing that's almost foreign today. People don't want to confess to God that they've done wrong. There was a, a, a time in all of our churches, even some that don't preach a clear gospel, that when invitation time came, the altars were full because God's people knew what they had done wrong. And they knew that they needed to deal with it. Perhaps today I would say the average Christian hasn't been to the altar in years. 
Maybe they're perfect. Except that would be contrary to God's word, wouldn't it? So I guess that doesn't work. So we need to admit to God. That's confession. That means saying the same thing or agreeing with God what he has already revealed to us about our lives and about what we're doing and the way we're living. We need to confess, say it out loud, or at least say it to God clearly, that we have done something that needs forgiveness. But that's where we really struggle. It's hard for us to be vulnerable. It's hard for us to admit weakness. I hate to admit weakness. I mean, physically, I hate to admit it. I still think I'm 30 years old. But my mind, in my mind I do, my body says, no, you're not. It doesn't let me do the things I used to do. I felt so bad this last week. I've never, I, if you can ask my church staff, I, I asked them for very few things. I had to get Joshua to help me ch change a light. I've hurt my elbow some way or other. I know what it was by. My wife's going to tell you and my daughter's going to tell you I was stupid. <laughs> you don't know that. <laughs> and I picked up a dishwasher and carried it in by myself. It was just a little heavy, it was just a little awkward. But I guess my arm didn't like it. So I don't like to admit that. And I'm getting it better, so I don't have to ever ask him again. It's humiliating to stand there and say, this is how you do it, but I can't do it. I don't like to admit weakness, do you? But spiritually, we get into that condition, and that's a major problem. We struggle because of pride and do not deal with those things that need to be dealt with. But it is important that we confess our sins to God. We must say we are sorry for sin, confess sin, repent of it. And we need, when we confess our sin, we need to be specific. Sometimes it's easier to say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, instead of saying, Lord, forgive me for lying to so-and-so. Forgive me for the gossip that I spread. We... We like to polish it over so it doesn't sound quite so bad, don't we? But you know, God knows our limits. He knows what we are. And he loves us while we're sinners. If you're not saved today, if you've never been born again, I want to tell you God knows what you're like. And God still loves you. The scripture says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew what you were like, but he loved you. And Jesus died for you. Other people can help us. Counselors can encourage us to get right with God, but it must be within our hearts to do something. No one is saved because their parents brought them up as a Christian. They're saved because they repented and received Christ as Savior. The Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the con mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So it isn't just the words. It is a matter of faith and a matter of trust. Now that applies to the unsaved. It applies to believers as well. When we have sinned against a brother or a sister in Christ, we must deal with the same barriers. And what we do is tend to deny that we have sinned. Or we make excuses, it's their fault. They caused this to happen. But we need to realize that we cannot afford to be prideful, prideful and get to the place that we do not want to confess our sins and seek forgiveness. You see, what we tend to do is forget when we sin against another We've actually sinned against God. 
David understood this when he sinned against Bathsheba and Uriah, her husband. So when he, in Psalm 51, when he went to the Lord, he says, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. And then he says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He said, even though we know the sins that he committed, when he got down to time to confess, he said, Lord, it's against you that I've sinned. It is against you that I've done this evil thing. You see, we like to think on this level, but we need to learn to think on this level when we confess our sins. He went on to say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right, uh, renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David acknowledged his sin and knew that restoration would come from God and confessed it. And then the final barrier is to accept forgiveness. Jesus said this, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Then he said, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. We often have trouble accepting forgiveness, don't we? It's a matter of faith, not feeling. Every now and then somebody will tell me, I don't feel like I'm saved. I don't care what you feel like. What do you believe? Who do you trust? That makes the difference. There's some days I don't feel saved. Just get up in a bad mood. Do you ever do that? Uh, well, I don't think a Christian ought to have a bad mood. So when I get up that way, I, something's wrong. But I go back to the word of God. Jesus saved me. He made me whole. And it's his word that I believe, not how I feel. It's not even how I think. It's what, what God has to say that makes that great difference. We can be forgiven and not feel like it. That is true. Uh, sometimes people ask others to forgive them, and they do, but then they walk away and say they really didn't. Usually what that boils down to is I know what I'm like, so they got to be like me. I know what I'm like, so God must be like me in this matter. We need to remember that uh, God keeps his word. It's a matter of trust. Do we believe God? Or is God a liar, according to our text? We can, in our mind, make him a liar if we say he doesn't forgive me, even though I've asked. First John 5 and verse 10 said, He that believeth the Son of God hath this witness in himself that he believeth, that, excuse me, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. You see, it's easier sometimes to persecute ourselves than to accept forgiveness. Our fallen nature wants to do something to help God out. So there's nothing I can do. That's the idea of many of the religions of the world today. Even some of the churches in America have that philosophy that yes, God saves me, but I, he needs a little help. I need to do this or I need to do that. They can't get a hold of a simple principle. Jesus paid it all. Nothing left to pay. If someone come to me today and say, preacher, I'm going to pay your house off. That's okay if anybody wants to do that, by the way. But guess what? If I went to the bank next week and say, I want to pay on the house, they'd say, you don't owe anything. 
They won't take my money for that. Now, they'll find a reason to take my money if I let them. But the reality is, it's all paid. Someone else paid it. Well, your debt before God, your sin debt has already been paid. So you can't pay anymore. How could you pay more when Jesus paid everything? The truth is, we need to claim God's forgiveness. Knowing that we don't deserve it, that he gives it to us anyway, that's called grace. We deserve an eternity in hell, but we get to go to heaven instead. That's called mercy. God calls us to walk in the light, not in darkness. That means living under God's care with his standards, with his view, with his word. Now, that never means that we're perfect. We're not. It doesn't mean that we'll not sin, because we do. As I said, this chapter really is written to Christians who have done some things wrong that need to deal with that and need to confess it. But it means that we will walk with him and make things right as he reveals them to us through his word. Then I have some good news. Barriers can be overcome. Every barrier that I've mentioned today can be overcome in our lives. We do that by admitting our need as a sinner, admitting that we're out of fellowship with God, and confessing that to God. To admit our need as a sinner out of fellowship with God is so essential, whether we're lost or whether we're Christians. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Will we confess our sin and receive Christ as Savior? Will we as Christians confess our sin and restore our relationship with God? What are we going to do about it? Are we walking in fellowship with God? Today, if you've never been saved, God loves you. But until you trust Jesus, there's a barrier that will not let you go to heaven. Doesn't matter how good you are, doesn't matter what you do, you need to receive Christ as your Savior. When that happens, then you're forgiven. Then God saves you for eternity and keeps you secure. Christian, why would we be miserable when we can be in fellowship with God? And yet, some are. The reason for most of our, our depression, the reason for most of our discouragement, the reason for most of our defeat is the fact that we are out of God's will. We can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4 with Cain and Abel and see that. But the reality is we can do something about it. The barrier can be overcome because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth from all sin. Let's stand together for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, and no one looks around for a minute. Just a couple simple questions. How many this morning can just raise their hand and say honestly, preacher, I've overcome one barrier. I've trusted Jesus Christ as my savior. I know I'm going to heaven. I know those sins are forgiven. I'm thankful for that. Just raise your hand for a moment. And see, that's most of us, and that's great. Now, let's ask another question. How many just raised their hand and could honestly say, you know, there's some things here in 1 John chapter 1 that apply to me. I need to confess my sin, knowing that God will forgive me. But there's some things in my life that are not right that I've not dealt with. And I need to. Would you pray for me, preacher? Just raise your hand for a second. Yes, several around the auditorium. Thank you. 
God bless you. Thank you. All right. I wonder if there's one that say, Preacher, I haven't, haven't raised my hand yet because I've never been saved, but I am concerned about it. I've not been born again. I know Jesus loves me. Would you just pray for me? I want to be right with God. Just raise your hand for a moment. I promise not to embarrass you or come get you. Thank you. Others? I'm All right. Thank you. God bless you. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your blessing today. We thank you for those who have been so honest. Some have already come to the altar. Others have asked me to pray for them as Christians uh, that your will be done in their life. And I pray that that uh, happens because they will be willing to step out, come to you and confess their need before you and get their sins covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray for those who need to know Jesus as their Savior. Help them this morning to come and let us take your word and show them how they can be saved. We ask your blessing upon each of those who have asked me to pray for them and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 210 in your hymn book, Jesus Paid It All. We sing that together. God speaks to your heart. Here's a place to pray, a time to come to the Lord. Won't you come? Jesus Paid It All, page 210. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me. that you'll be back tonight the evening service at six o'clock remember our anniversary it would be great if if all of us would just look around see somebody that's not here and make sure that they're invited to be here next week maybe even go through some of your old directories we've got some folks that have moved uh, might come back for a special day we'd love to have them uh, and uh, be be part of that maybe bring some neighbors if all of us worked on this We'd have a tremendous time next week, so we encourage you to come. I believe we have a deacon's meeting today, so uh, be aware of that. And uh, if you're a deacon, and we'll look forward to that. All right, let's go ahead and be dismissed in prayer at this time then. Thank you again for, for being with us. Uh, we'd ask uh, if uh, Brother DeWitt, are you still in here? I lost you. Oh, there you are. I thought you hid from me. Would you pray for us?